come here and you think, how am I going to go home? How am I going to fix this? This is a really big problem. And I really hope that you had time to network with other groups and connect with them before you left, or before they left, because you're still here. So what's important for us to realize is to remember our goal in doing this. And your goal in doing this is to not try to put out every single fire um, that comes up in this topic. Okay, you're not... Please don't try to stretch your churches, your resources, your ministries, your organizations to address a million different aspects of this. There will always be more aspects of this and more ways you can dial it down and hone it in and more demographics that you can reach. I want to share a story with you. I'm a storyteller. I'm not a lecturer. There's no PowerPoint, so you can rest your iPhones. They're tired, so you can give them a nap. <laughs> They're tired of being, you're tired of taking pictures of slides. I'm a storyteller, first and foremost. I'm not a lecturer. Um, I'm not really an organizational leader. I just speak and I share my story. And so I have a story from last night, and I'm going to embarrass somebody I know, maybe, if he's in here. Um, last night, I went back to my room, and I was practicing my speech for today when my speech practice was interrupted by a gaggle, maybe a gaggle, I'm not sure if that's what they're called, of drunk college frat boys in the hallway outside of my room. And I have no problem with drunk college frat boys in the hallway outside of my room until said drunk college frat boys try to get into my room. <laughs> then we have a problem, we have a, we have a breach. And I'm in my room as a, as a single woman and whether we like it or not, we do live in a rape culture, right? And we, we have to live in that understanding. And I know that I am perfectly safe. I have my sliding lock done, I always do that. But there's these guys who are so drunk, they don't even know that this is not their room. They're knocking on the door. I'm not sure who they're expecting to have answered if it's their room. And they're just, they're rolling around on the floor. They're hitting on this girl that's in the hallway with him. They're talking about how they want to, you know, have their way with her later. And they're at the door of my room. And I'm trying to prepare for a talk today. And they're really bugging me. Um, so I'm on Facebook. <laughs> telling the Facebook world, like, this always happens to me. Why does this always happen to me? I always get the psycho next door neighbors in the hotel. Why can't I have like another speaker or somebody who's halfway normal? Why do I have to have the drunk college frat boys? And about that time, the drunk college frat boys realized that their room is actually the one next to mine. And so they, you know, stumble over into the room next to mine, which happens to be a conjoined room. So then they find the conjoining door, and I don't know what they thought it was in their drunken stupor, but then they're at the conjoining door, banging on the conjoining door, messing with the lock, and conjoining doors require mutual consent. You know, you open your side, I open mine, and they were opening their side and trying to bust through mine, and I'm in my room, mildly terrified. I don't think they're gonna come through. I mean, with locks, hello. And I know Krav Maga, so if they come through, like, we're gonna be missing kneecaps, but, for me, still, it's not a good situation to be in. I don't feel safe. Right? I no longer feel safe in a place where I should feel safe. I came to the hotel because I didn't want to be sleeping on the streets because I wanted to feel safe, right? And now I've got these men who don't know any better. They're not after me, but I don't feel safe. So I'm on Facebook, and my, my female friends, you know, it's the end of the world. Jessica, get out of that room. Call the front desk. Get, go, go, get out of there. It's so scary. And then Sam Black, is he in here? Are you in here, Sam? No, he's not. Yes, we can talk about him while he's gone. Score. Okay, Sam, I don't even, I've never met Sam. Sam works for Covenant Eyes. I used to blog for Covenant Eyes pretty regularly. Sam just out of nowhere Facebooks me and says, I will come and I will switch rooms with you. I will, I will save you. <laughs> and so we ended up switching rooms and Sam came down from his room because the hotel was sold out. And Sam came down and he, he rescued me from the drunk college frat boys next door and let me go up to his room where it was quiet and safe. And I have no idea how last night went. Maybe that's why he's not here. But, <laughs> but I'm here, so we're good. Why would Sam do that? What was the point? Is it the point that I am some incapable, weak woman? Is the point that it's wrong to be a drunk college frat boy? No, the point is, I needed to feel safe. Here you are. Hi. <laughs> He's like, 
<laughs> He's like, I don't know what just happened. I got a clapping ovation for coming through the door. <laughs> but the point is we want to feel safe, and people should feel safe. And so when you're here and you're learning about all this, the point is not to turn around and shut down all of this stuff. There's always going to be bad stuff. And I totally appreciate the work of Nikosi, and we need it. Right? We need the law on our side, but we also have to understand that part of what we are doing is defending people. We're walking into situations and saying, this is not safe. This is not right. It's not right for you to feel unsafe in a marriage because your husband is addicted to pornography. It's not right for women to be victimized. It's not right for boys to be victimized. It's not right for children to be victimized. This is not right. And that's when we're coming into these situations and doing something. It's not because we have a problem with it religiously. It's not because we have a problem with it morally. It's because this is not right. And as ministries or groups or organizations, we all kind of take our place in a line, like a wall. If you think about it like a wall. So you defend this portion, and you stand between these victims and the people who are trying to hurt them. And then beside you stands another group who fills in this gap here. There are so many great groups that were here. Um, one of the ones I ran into is Changing Lanes. And they, their founder has been a follower of my blog for years. And one of the things that they do is they go into schools and they talk to parents, or they talk to parents, about the apps that their teens have. Parents think, okay, we've got, you know, we've talked to our kids about this, they know better. Do you know that your kids can get around some things on your phone that you set up? Do you know what kind of apps they're looking at? They fill in these gaps. So you have other ministries here that fill in these gaps. And I want to encourage you to take advantage of those ministries. Please don't reinvent the wheel. And remember that we are, we stand, it's a coalition, right? We're a team. We stand together to defend people and stand up for what is right. It's not because people are weak or inferior or anything like that, but because there are situations that are not right. It is not right for humans to be sold, for humans to be trafficked, and for people to be victimized. It's not right. And that's why we're here. So the official name, the title of my session, is The Rise and Risk of Female Porn Use. It makes me sound so smart. <laughs> But the reality is, I actually had just had to pick a title because Don made me. Um, I want to talk to you today. I want to share a story. Again, I'm a storyteller. So if, we want to, if you want statistics, I have them. We know that one in three visitors to adult websites is a woman. Okay, and this is just, it's something that we don't talk about. We just have this, this script and this dialogue, and I'm thankful for people like Matt Frad and Josh McDowell and Clay and John, Dr. John Fobert, who put the fact that women struggle into their presentations. If you saw, they, they mentioned it, Matt mentioned it in his, Clay had it in little parentheses in his. We're starting to start this conversation, but the reality is we're starting it a little behind, right? We're catching up. Because the reality is that 20% of American women, 20%, struggle with pornography. Okay, this is on the rise, and why is it on the rise? Why? We ask why, and we don't ask why like that, right? We ask why like, why? Because we talk about pornography as objectification of women, violence towards women, abuse of women, abuse of children, and then you sit there and you say, women can't do that, this is men. And we picture all pornography users as a creepy Ted Bundy. Right? And so when I say women use pornography, it kind of glitches us out here. <laughs> like, I don't understand what to do with this. I don't understand how to, to process that. And we run down this, this track, these ruts, if you will. All men who use porn are evil, bad men. And Clay talked about that. We vilify the porn user. And then the, we victimize the women only. We don't talk about the boys being victims, and we don't ever talk about the women being users. We don't have that conversation. Those lines don't cross. And so we come down this, this track, if you will, and then we slam face first into a female porn user, and we have no idea what to do with her. She doesn't fit in a box. right? Like She's not fitting the script. You're not following the rules. And we look at her and we say, what is wrong with you? When the real question we should be asking is, what is wrong with our dialogue? What is wrong with how we've set this up? What is going on? That's what needs to change. It's, nothing's wrong with her. We've been talking about this all wrong. We need to fix it. 
why do women watch pornography? Why are they exposed to pornography? Well, their boyfriends are introducing them to it. They're finding it on accident. Their husbands are doing it. They're watching it, and the wives are saying, huh, maybe I'm missing something here. What am I missing out on? And you think, but don't they understand that it's victimization of women? Don't they get that it's so unhealthy for them? And no, they don't. That's not the message they're hearing. That's the message we know, but that's not the message they're hearing. They're hearing it's empowering. They're hearing that it's liberating. There are books on the market right now written for the express purpose of encouraging women to like pornography. I found them in my local library, out in the open. Like Anybody can pick them up and read them. And the whole point of the book is to tell you that pornography is not bad, it's not wrong, and as a woman, you have every right to enjoy it. So we have to understand something about pornography. When we talk about it, we often talk about kids being the final frontier on pornography. And you need to understand something. Kids are not the final frontier on pornography. Women are. Pornography has been after your kids for years. When I was first exposed to pornography, when I was 13, back in 1999, there were cartoon characters involved in hardcore pornography. Like Winnie the Pooh, like Mickey Mouse. Your kids could go online and could search for Goofy or Donald just completely innocently and find Goofy and Donald engaged in pornographic acts online. Pornography has been after your kids, and we do need to do everything we can to protect them, so please stop giving them smartphones, by the way. But what we're not realizing is that women are kind of the final bastion, right? They are the mothers who are protecting their children. They are the women who are standing up for others who have been victimized. We're the nurturers. It's what we do. So when we see a woman who is stuck in pornography, it just, it's like, how? How are you doing this? How could you do this? And the fact of the matter is, the pornography industry is after her. They're a business, and they will always be a business. Sexual exploitation, human trafficking, all of it will always be a business. And the goal of a business is always to expand your client base and increase your profit. Done. And if the men are oversaturated, and we're going after the children efficiently, which they are, then your last holding point are the mothers and the women who are standing up and trying to tell you that you have a problem with pornography. If we can shut them down, if we can quiet them down, if we can make it not such a big deal, then we've won the women over too. So for years, the porn industry has been working on developing material for women. Sorry. For the express purpose of drawing women into pornography. And why does this matter? I have done no studies, because I'm not a researcher. I have read studies. And I was doing a research recently, reading old studies, trying to debunk or prove this idea of men are visually wired. You probably have heard that. You probably used that. And I wanted to know if it was true, because we use that, and then we, we contrast it by saying then women are emotionally wired. And in this study that I have found from the early 2000s, Researchers found two things that were important, two different studies. First off, they found that a woman can be visually attracted to pornography. These studies are at least 10 years old. So this has been, like, we are way behind. <laughs> but they found that a woman can be attracted to pornography. However, she is attracted to pornography and aroused by pornography in relation to her ability to picture herself as the woman in the video, okay? So a woman is attracted to and aroused by pornography to the extent that she can picture herself as being the woman in the video. See, we, we look at it like consumers of pornography are the ones exploiting women, but we need to understand something, that when a woman consumes pornography, she's exploiting herself, right? She is picturing herself as that woman who is receiving all of that abuse or that violence, and she's getting off on it. Well, obviously, when I was exposed to pornography, um, I was 13, 
And one moment I'm watching Magic School Bus completely by accident. Okay, not I was doing that on purpose, but <laughs> I was watching Magic School Bus online. This is like 1999, like dial up, right? So it was like a 10 second clip and it took forever to load, right? And then the next clip was pornography. And in a matter of minutes, I had been exposed to, in one video, at 13, I had been exposed to anal, oral, and gangbang sex. 13. I went from not having any idea what really sex kind of was to having way too much information and no way to process any of it. I had been preyed upon by the industry, and that was way too strong, way too strong. But it made me go, where's the softer stuff? And that's what we're finding with people who use pornography. They start with the softer stuff, and then they kind of work their way up. Another thing that the study found, or different study found, was that when men watch pornography, and you've seen this before, you've seen the brain scans of how their brains light up, and how their, their emotional part of their brain, like the one that makes them want to do manly things, lights up. And that's also where we process like, our compassion for people and our, and our, that same, the amygdala. Did I say that right, somebody who's smarter than me? Okay, good. <laughs> that part lights up for men. A backup study to that, a further study of that, found compared to women, it lit up for men, guess what part didn't light up for women? Women who are aroused by pornography did not show any activity in the emotional part of their brain. It's shut down. So what are we saying? We're saying that women who are porn users are picturing themselves as the women in the video. They're taking the place of the women in the video and they feel nothing. It's easy for us to victimize porn users. Clay talked about it. It's easy for us to sorry, vilify porn users. It's easy for us to say, oh, you're horrible people. Don't you understand what you're doing? Don't you see what you're doing to these women? Don't you get it? And we don't realize that the enemy here is not a porn user. The enemy here is pornography. So the enemy here is the idea that people can just be beat around, and that it's fun, and that it's cool, and that it's OK. And pornography is their genius, brilliant marketing plan is to just soften it a little bit to bring women in, because they know eventually they'll get them down there. So we have to understand that pornography is grooming. Do you know what the grooming process is? Have we talked about that this weekend? Yes? Perfect. Pornography is grooming the next generation of sex trafficking victims. We are standing dangerously close, dangerously close to the edge of a generation of women who will be raised to traffic themselves and think that it is completely acceptable and think that it's expected. They're going to think that's what it means to be a woman. I was exposed when I was 13. You want to know what a pornography addict looks like? I had a 4.0, grew up in the church, went to church religiously, three times on Sunday, one time during the week, any kind of big tent, any kind of missions, any kind of potluck, we were there. The, the theory was if the doors of the church were open, your butt was in the seat. <laughs> like, and you needed to be actively vomiting or dying to not go to church. And this is what I was raised up in. I was active in my school. I had a great social life. I was the teacher's pet. I was on the school newspaper. I ran the school newspaper. I was on drama teams. I was worked in my church. I served as a vacation Bible school volunteer. I worked in the nursery. I sang in the choir. I went to talent competitions and won. This is what I did, all the while addicted to pornography. Okay, this, is what it, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look like Ted Bundy. Right? It doesn't look like a slut. And that's what we can so often do. We're like, oh, but you, <laughs> you, no, you is exactly the kind of women that struggle with this. The women who struggle are the pastor's wives, are the Sunday school teachers, are these women. And I walked through my whole life thinking, I can't tell anybody 
oh my goodness, I cannot tell anybody. My mom will die. My pastors, I don't even know about my pastors. Like, that's not going to happen. Pastors' wives, they're 80 years old. They are going to croak. It'll be over. I, I'm, not, I'm not killing people. That's not my job. So I went all the way through high school. And by the time I was 17 and going off to Christian college, going off to Christian college to go on to get my medical degree because I was a total nerd, I was consumed by pornography. It had taken over my life. It had taught me everything I knew about sex. It had taught me everything I knew about how to be a woman. And interestingly enough, I was never sexually active. I never acted out, ever. Because my mom, like, growing up, sex was bad. <laughs> Pornography's not sex. It's a perfectly safe alternative to sex. It's not a big deal. There's no STDs, no babies. I don't have to worry about it. It's great. By the time I got to college, 17 years old, it had consumed every part of my life. And I thought, okay, if I can just accomplish this, then I won't need it anymore. If I can just find value in this, in, in getting a 4.0 in college, or in making friends in college, or in finding a boyfriend, if I can just find something else, then I won't need pornography anymore. And I looked for help, and there was nothing. Everything said men. And I thought, how on earth did I end up being the only woman in the world who likes this stuff? Seriously, like, how did this happen? And I thought, okay, I have to get caught, but I'm not going to let myself get caught. You know, like, it's weirdest. We pray really weird prayers sometimes, like, dear Jesus, please let me get caught, but I'm going to do everything possible to make sure that doesn't happen. So you're going to have to be really, really powerful to make this happen. And I was caught. And they pulled me into the office, and I was into very, very, very dark pornography, very violent towards women, very, very dark, and they were alarmed. And they said, whoever this man is needs a lot of help. Whoever these men are need a lot of help. This is sick. This is twisted. That being said, we know this wasn't you. Women just don't have this problem. And I walked back, knowing full well that I was a woman, knowing full well that I had this problem, and being completely confused. But if there's one woman in the world, or one group of women in the world, who like pornography, it's got to be the women in pornography, right? You're allowed to be a freak there. You're allowed to like the stuff there. They liked it, don't they? So I was 17 years old, and I threw away all of my dreams of becoming a doctor, all of my desires to be a good student, all of my desires to be a, a good sister or a good child of God or whatever. I, looked at, I didn't look at God. I prayed. I don't see him. <laughs> don't worry. But I looked and I said, I messed up. I'm too far gone. Like, there's no, there is no hope for me. Like, I am some kind of freak. I'm not really, I don't think I'm even human. Because if women don't do this, and what do I do? And it was like in that moment that I realized I was getting some kind of sick satisfaction from watching other women get beat up and brutalized. And so I thought, you know, the only thing I can do with my life, the only thing I can do with my life is become a porn star. 17 years old. Grew up in the church. And I thought the only thing that I have left, 4.0 student, successful person, and the only thing I have left, the only thing I'm worth is to be a porn star and to be in these videos and to be, just to be in the industry. And so I started making really bad choices. I am a very logical person. None of my choices in this time period of my life were logical at all. The next man who liked me on a chat room, I gave him everything. Gave him my real name, gave him my phone number, gave him my address, gave him access to our school's intraweb. He had access to every single female college student at that school because of me. And he's asked me for pictures. I was 17 years old. And I sent him pictures. And I hated every last minute of it. And he said, Jessica, why did you do it? I didn't think I had a choice. Because the only women who liked porn were the women who were in porn. And I was never going to get out of it. He emailed me back, said, you're beautiful, and I would, have, I would have done anything for him. I was 17 years old. Those pictures will never go away. 
I don't remember who it was, but someone was talking about how women are held captive by their photos. I hate the fact that out there right now somebody could be using my pictures. I produce child pornography. I was 17 years old at a Christian college, good church girl, producing child porn. And I hated every moment of it, but I thought that that's all it was worth. Listen to me. Pornography is grooming the next generation of sex trafficking victims. And what's going to be really mind-blowing is there's not going to be a suspect, right? There was no suspect for me. It was somebody who asked me, and I gave it to him. So how do we, how do we fix this? What do we do? Because we need to fix this. What's going to happen is we're going to go out and we're going to close down brothels and we're going to pass laws and we're going to do all this stuff and we're going to turn around and we're going to fix these men and we're going to finally have them pioneering and we're going to have them championing for women and then we're going to turn around and have women who don't want it. We're going to turn around and have women who want the men to act like pimps, who want the men to act like molesters, who want that because they believe that that's what they're supposed to do. There's three steps if you're a note taker. Three steps, and I have like three minutes, so let's go. Okay, N-U-E, so for something to be, and I just totally made this up on my own, so like don't take this like a sociologist or anything. <laughs> N-U-E, we've got to normalize it. It became something normal in my life, right? It, it just, I did it all the time, and we hear that now, like, oh, it's totally normal, it's totally fine, you're expressing your sexuality, it's not a problem. Totally normal. The next thing that has to happen is the consequences have to be unseen. Okay, unseen victims, unseen consequences. We don't talk about the damage. We don't talk about the women who are hurt. I never heard any of that. It was totally normal. There weren't any consequences. And then all of a sudden, it becomes an expectation. N-U-E. Every expectation that we have, think about our young men and how we deal with our young men, it was normalized for them, they didn't know the consequences, and now we almost expect that men struggle with pornography. We are almost there with women. How do we fix it? We see them. We see them. That's how we, that's how we stop this. It's not huge and complicated. You don't need to launch a new initiative. You don't need to develop a new program, start a new nothing. Just see them. There are so many women who are just looking for someone to say, you exist. 20% of women in America struggle with pornography. Every last one of them that has come to me has said one thing, I thought I was alone. How can 20% of women individually all believe they are alone? We're not doing our job. All you have to do is see them, super easy, and if you've heard me talk before, you know what the answer is. The word and, and I'm so grateful for the men who have presented this week that have included this in their presentations, and. Men and women struggle with pornography. Men and women can be victims of pornography. And, you know, those ruts, all we have to do is connect them. It's that easy. You don't have to revolutionize your ministry and overhaul it. All you have to do is see them. And by seeing them, you acknowledge, I see your struggle, I see your pain, and I'm telling you, you don't have to go this far. This isn't normal. This isn't okay. And we are here to help you. And I want to encourage you, please, if you need help reaching out to women, there is a, a movement of women coming up through this who are starting ministries for this. And I am here, I've been doing this for seven years. Crystal Renaud is here with Dirty Girls Ministry. She has been doing this for over seven years as well. If you need any help wanting to know how to do this, please just come to us, because we do not want to get to the place where we have a generation of girls who are just giving themselves away because they think they're supposed to. And all it takes is just saying, we see you, we know you're there, and we're going to help you.